from the Office of International Programs. Welcome to the International Symposium. We are so glad you are here. This session is what critical youth empowerment and civic engagement looks like globally and locally, and is presented by Dr. Louise Jennings, who's a professor in the School of Education at CSU. Ross Atkinson, who is going to be joining us, he's a PhD candidate in the School of Education, and then Kok Pham, who is a PhD candidate at the School of Education as well. Uh, before we begin, I have a small request. We would be grateful if you could share a short feedback form with us before you leave. This is going to be on the QR code here up in front of you, but for those of you online, it's going to be a link in the chat and it will be there at the end of the session. Um, thank you for being here again. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Louise and Ross and Toby. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here, whether you're here in the room or whether you're joining us online. <laughs> really glad to be here on this beautiful day, sharing with you about our research on critical youth empowerment. Um, what we're gonna do today is first share with you about the research and then move on to engage you in um, an activity to help you think about how uh, various dimensions of critical youth empowerment might inform your work or your studies or your own civic engagement in your communities. Um, so first I wanted to talk with you about what is critical youth empowerment? Um, let's think first about what is youth empowerment or even empowerment. And some time ago, Westheimer and Kahn came up with a framework for thinking about different ways to be civically engaged and empowered in our communities. And the first way is by being a participatory citizen. Maybe you contribute some cans to a canned food drive to address a community issue of hunger in the community. Another way is to be a responsible citizen. You actually organize the canned food drive and take a leadership role in your organizing. And then a third way is to be a social justice action oriented citizen. And you're saying, why in a wealthy community do we need canned food drives? Why, when we have people working two or three jobs to feed their families, that still isn't enough in our society. And they need to go to a food shelter to get some food, you know, to really dig into the sociopolitical structures and systems that are creating that community need and then take action to address it. Maybe, you know, rather than organizing a camp food drive, organizing a civic action to, um, to ensure that the minimum wage is raised um, in, in your state or in your nation or even in your community. Um, so, so really taking that kind of action. So um, my colleagues and I in 2006 and so in the University of South Carolina, um, Deborah Paramedina, uh, Dr. Deanne Macias, Perry McLaughlin, and some other graduate students working interdisciplinarily across um, public health, education, and nursing, as well as sociology, we were asking the question, how do we support youth empowerment? That's more of the third type, the social justice orient type, oriented type, what we call critical youth empowerment. And what we did is we worked looking at different models of empowerment and youth empowerment that had been published. And we uh, engaged with those models and applied them to understanding how various youth organizations across the state of South Carolina were seeking to empower youth and see how those models apply. And then saw that none of those models really fully satisfied what we saw as critical youth empowerment. And, um, and developed our own model that I'll be sharing with you shortly. So it's a theoretical model and a resource for youth programs that seeks to support young people, particularly those who are disenfranchised and marginalized historically, um, to be active agents of change and transformation in their communities through both their own individual level empowerment and through cultivating a community level empowerment or social advocacy as well as self-advocacy. Um, this is really built on the work of Paulo Freire, who is a Brazilian uh, educator 
saw that what we really needed to do to be emancipatory and, and in other words, transformative in our communities is to engage in dialogue to identify social issues, community issues in our community through our own lived experience, understanding those issues through our own lived experience and critically reflect upon those experiences and issues in order to take action to address them and redress them. And so uh, Ryan, Ryan and Nevala in 2017 calls this emancipatory empowerment. And we're going back and forth seeing critical empowerment and emancipatory empowerment in the same vein. So the CYE framework posits that there are six different dimensions that youth programs in or out of school need to be engaged in, in order to support emancipatory or critical empowerment. The first two are typical across youth organizations, whether they're seeking to be emancipatory or not. And that includes a welcoming safe environment and also cultivating meaningful participation and engagement so that um, youth are really engaged with topics that matter to them um, and that really make a difference <laughs> with them, that they're very youth-centered. There are four more dimensions that we see are less typical among youth organizations and very central to being emancipatory or critical. And that includes equitable power sharing among adults and youth so that it's not just youth sitting back passively and taking direction from adults, but that they have the opportunity to cultivate their own leadership skills. Um, engagement and critical reflection on interpersonal and socio-political processes. So this means that they're, um, they're really seeking to understand, like we said with the canned food drives, the underlying issues behind hunger in our communities, what's going on systemically and structurally to cause those issues and what actions can we take to dismantle those oppressive systems. Participation in socio-political processes to affect change. That means now, okay, we've identified some of the issues. What actions can we take to address and redress those issues? And finally, then you're working both with developing individual empowerment skills as well as community empowerment skills. You're working not just as many youth organizations do to help young people become engaged leaders, but also helping them to be engaged in their communities, which is so important for dem democratic participation and civic engagement. Here's the part Ross was gonna do, and we hope he's okay. Um, but he did a wonderful job in about 2020, 2021, while we were all going through COVID and doing a wonderful literature review to see, well, how was our CYE model being taken up globally? We were sort of surprised. I was surprised to and glad to see that this CYE model framework that we provided, that we constructed <laughs> in 2006 has since been taken up by youth organizations and um, youth um, scholars around the world. And he did a wonderful job of seeing how, I'm going to try to point out here. Yes, it works. Um, through uh, most of these throughout North America, including Canada and the US and Mexico, uh, quite a number of programs in South America, Africa, this isn't working. It, it won't work when it's pointed at the television, oh, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> just, just because of the light that's coming from the TV. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so there are various examples of CYE in practice and at varying levels um, that, that some of them were really taking up critical youth empowerment fully and engaging it fully as a, a way of evaluating their youth programs to see were they being emancipatory or critical. Um, and many of them engaged those first few of those six dimensions of critical youth empowerment, but didn't quite get to the more critical aspects. Others use them to really develop and design their own youth programs to try to 
create critical youth empowerment programs. Um, so we were really pleased to see that. And we really wanted, oh, I, I'm gonna give you an example now. Right, Ross? <laughs> For example, in the Whitefish River, Na River First Nation program, um, they decided to act upon youth well-being because of an increased rate of youth suicide that really devastated the community. Um, as a community, they wanted to support their young people and partnered with a program called Play to create a youth leadership program. And um, we've got an almost three-minute clip about this program that we're going to hopefully play for you now. Hold on just a second, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Two years old. And I am the right to play team. About four, maybe five years ago now, there's been a lot of suicides. There's been three in one year. And it hit us pretty hard and the whole community was this whole dark place. And then the program came out. Two, three. Blue Jesus! If you get tagged, you have to go back onto your side, or you can stay in the safe zone, which is in the circle. in this community and the surrounding communities. Um, I definitely see some leaders and I'm seeing a lot more self-esteem. Well, I like the activities because I do learning stuff and when new people come in, I can meet them and learn new things too. I'm not a poor sport anymore. No? Uh, if I get tagged or hit, I don't get all of them. We need to play, and we need to have fun, and we need to have joy, and we need to have um, a way for us to express ourselves in a positive way that you're learning something and building on something. Leadership, communication, that's, yeah, it's just like, that's the main emphasis of it, and that's just like, that's something that you, you'll need for a really long time. This program runs on the youth, the youth voices. And I think if they all step up and their voices are heard, they can make a change. No one else can. And if the youth can do it here, if the youth band together, they can change something on a grander scale. Is there more? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, hope that gave you a good overview of the, um, the play and youth leadership program. This program was later evaluated by researchers using the critical youth empowerment model and provides an example of CYE action. So that's one of the articles that was in our literature review that really fully engaged the CYE model. And it was really helpful to see how they applied it to the development of their program and the assessment of the program because it helped see what worked well of those six dimensions and also where there were some shortcomings in the model that were hard to address and challenging. And so um, here's how we see the CYE and how they talked in their article about how the CYE dimensions were applied. So a welcoming and safe environment by creating a space they could see the simplest dimension to implement. From, and from the perspective of a local elder, this was the most important and central stage of the model where safety was relevant to culture and grounding that within that community, it was so important for the youth and the white river fish and the white fish river nation, first nation 
to um, feel that they were safe and um, and welcomed and that their voices were important and to be culturally responsive uh, to their needs. They were a large part of the program's decision-making process and so it was meaningful participation and engagement. They were keen to participate, to learn about their culture and to question how these teachings could be incorporated into their lives. There was equitable power sharing between youth and adults and as youth members became older, they were pushed but still supported to take on larger leadership roles in the community. And as the youth become more involved and use the skills they learn, the decision-making power of this youth increases. They engaged in critical reflection on interpersonal and socio-political processes um, by first identifying that what they needed to do to address their community issue of um, of um, substance abuse among young people was to recognize that there was a shed that was being used to abuse substances. And what they needed to do, the youth all agreed, was to remove the shed. Um, that that was a systemic part of the problem um, of substance abuse. Um, as they talked about the shed was being abused and Chris described why the youth wanted to take action saying we've been realizing that a lot of kids would go to that building for drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. So we wanted to take it down. So they participated in socio-political processes to affect change by first meeting with the chief. So engaging with the community and with um, decision makers and people who have political power in the community is an important part of CYE. Part of this meeting's agenda with the chief which was drafted by the youth, was ensuring that the chief knew that they would be part of the whole process. It would be the youth who would make the proposal, demolish the building, and explain their reasons for tearing down the shed to the community. So it really had it to be seen as a youth-led action and decision. They integrated individual and community empowerment by facilitating a relationship between the elders, the parents, and individuals in community leader roles and community members saw firsthand the youth planning and facilitating intergenerational events for all community members, which gave exposure to their leadership skills and their desire for community building. And I think as you could see in the video clip, then really provided more opportunities to, to bring the youth into community level decisions. Trying to advance. So, from the literature review that Ross and Dr. Channing um, conducted in 2011, 2021, sorry, uh, that Dr. Channing just mentioned, um, we wanted to examine further um, the cases of the youth programs that fully engage in the CYE model uh, to understand the extent to which the CYE has supported and constrained um, emancipatory practices of youth programs. We also want to make visible barriers to emancipatory youth empowerment that these programs encounter. Uh, from this analysis, we, we aim to um, understand the limitations, the strengths, and the barriers um, of the CYE framework in foster youth empowerment. Um, the third goal of our studies also is to identify critical civic capacity um, that were engaged across the five programs so that um, for us to understand how the CYE framework contribute to um, the development of active, um, informed, and engaged citizens. Um, lastly, we want to propose recommendations for theory and practice to um, contribute to continue to uh, contribute to the ongoing development of the CYE framework, but also the recommendation uh, practical guidance for program uh, that seeks to um, integrate the CYE framework into their programs. Um, so in the screen is a summary of like, the five case studies that we um, selected um, and conducted a case study, a comparative case studies analysis. Um, the, the program number two is the youth uh, leadership program uh, that Dr. Jennings just gave you an overview. Um, the first program is the PAC. Um, Dr. Jennings, later in the presentation, she will go in details 
uh, to illustrate how um, the patch program um, address the, the dimensions of the CYE framework. Um, so I just give you an example of the um, two example of the team empowering program to illustrate how this program uses CYE as an evaluation tool and the, y, the YC Yamaha Center Blocks program, the last one to illustrate how this program um, used the CYE as um, in their program design and um, evaluation tool. Um, so the team empowerment program is a year long program um, in Toronto, Canada, um, that in this program, they uh, recruit and train um, 14 to 18 year old high risk youth of color um, to critically examine social justice, uh, social issues in the community, and also take action to um, improve community through um, social change efforts. Um, in the YC Blocks program, this one is also a year-long program, and in this program, um, they work with um, the same the same um, age group, 18 to 14 year old um, historically marginalized youth. Um, so in this program, youth have an opportunity to do research, to um, go out to the community and interview um, uh, people in the community to listen to their story, listen to their concerns. Um, Related to social uh, like issues um, in the community, and then they have a chance to write, um, to use different literacy modes to express their voices, and then they also um, use their analytical skills. Um, so at the end of the program, they organize a community event uh, where they display um, all of their writings um, for the whole, and they invite the community to come and see uh, to. Like for them to hear like the voices of the youth, also like the voices of people in the community. Um, they also hold, they also have a meeting with um, city planner, um, with um, community organizers, um, or people who can um, bring change to the community to challenge, to bring like their voices and then to challenge, to engage in that um, discussion with people in leadership roles. So although they don't actually like, actually, like engage in the, the social actions, but they engage in the initial, initial part where they talk and have a conversation and challenge um, community planners um, to bring change to the community. Um, so you can see that like our analysis, we make visible um, the complexity and the challenges uh, of implementing the CYE in after school programs. Uh, but also through the analysis, we also develop the um, critical civic capacity to demonstrate um, um, to demonstrate um, how we can um, how the um, so how this program can help um, can help you to develop um, the four areas, knowledge, skills, dispositions, and actions. So Dr. Jennings um, handed out like the handout, and in the handout you will see the, um, the critical civic capacity table that we developed from the analysis of the five programs. So civic, critical civic knowledge, um, this, this refers to an opportunity provided by the CYE program for youth to gain insight about how communities operate, understand existing civic and community structure processes and practices, power structures, and also to help them get understanding about how to affect community change. Um, skills refers to how CYE programs um, help you develop practical competency to participate in and transform community. So you can see the definition that we put in the first round of the table. Um, civic disposition refers to attitudes and habit of mind that support participation in and transformation of communities. And the last one is civic actions. Um, is refers to how program utilizing CYE programs cultivate uh, co-construct and examine actions uh, and practices with the intention to bring about systematic transformation of communities. Um, later in the presentation, uh, Dr. Channings, we will look at like this model and to reflect in the youth program that you have a chance to engage in um, or plan to build in the future. So yes, uh, 
at some point in the <laughs> presentation now, I'm going to share with you how we saw different ways that um, one youth organization, one that I happen to be co-director of and also researcher of for about four years right here on campus, um, or sometimes in the Fort Collins community, um, an after-school program that supported students in critical empowerment that we call public achievement or PACT, Public Achievement for Community Transformation. Um, public achievement is a model that's been used nationally and internationally to also help young people identify issues in their community and take actions to address it through six different phases. And so we brought together the CYA framework and the PA stages and applied them to designing and, um, and implementing this youth empowerment program. And so I'm going to demonstrate to you particularly how we saw those that table that we just handed out to you, the range of ways that this program offered opportunities to cultivate critical civic capacities, even if those were in, in the overall program, which lasted usually a school year, um, was limited in how far we could take the youth in, in emancipatory empowerment. It did give them multiple opportunities to cultivate critical civic capacities. So here they are actually standing on the fourth floor of the BSB building, enjoying uh, a tour of campus on their first day of meeting that year. And it includes um, youth who are actually undergraduate students who are the coaches or mentors who we trained them as trainers to end up running the youth programs. So first of all, um, through the community building phase, uh, we would take several weeks to uh, help the youth build community as an organization and also think about, well, who am I? And then who am I in my community and, and in my communities? So we did a lot of work of team building, different team building games. Um, we had them engage in also social cultural identity work, such as going through the social identity wheel and creating um, a me poster to talk about, well, what are my social cultural identities and how do I best express them? And what role does that play? How am I then positioned in my community and communities um, as a young person, maybe as a young person of color, a Latina, maybe as um, somebody who's on an autism spectrum, you know, all these different types of social identities. So doing that social cultural identity work at the same time that we're building community was really important. So through that, we see cultivating various knowledge skills, dispositions, and actions um, that are important for critical capacity building. Then they identified an issue in their community. Um, we did that with them through various ways. Sometimes they just did some research about various issues in their community, got in teams and presented on those issues, and then deliberated together democratically and voted on which issue they wanted to address that year. This year, this particular year, and for a couple of years, we used Photo Voice, where we gave youth cameras and asked them to take photos of issues in their community. And then they got together and um, annotated printouts of those photos, assembled them into different groups and clusters of different community issues. And then they um, democratically um, uh, voted on which issue they wanted to address. Then they did research about well, what were the sociopolitical undercurrents of that particular issue. In this case, they decided that environmental degradation was an issue in more laypersons terms, probably more teen per terms. They were saying there's too much littering on our school grounds and our school communities. And one reason for that is there are no recycling bins on the school grounds outside. They're recycling in the school, but even in the school, recycling isn't um, being engaged enough. And we need to really address littering and recycling in our schools. 
So they were identifying community issues and needs, building their knowledge of sociopolitical processes and structures. Again, they were looking at well, why is it that it's a problem, that littering is a problem and recycling is a problem. And they said, we need more education in our schools. We need our schools to develop a better system of recycling um, in, in the classrooms and on the school grounds and inform youth about that and so on. So they developed brainstorming skills, analytic skills, engaged in reflexive dialogue and decision-making and cultivated dispositions of collaborative participation. They then um, engaged in the planning community action and they decided to call their campaign Recycle It and they got bracelets um, that said Recycle It on it with the exclamation point, very important. Um, and what they did is they then sat down and planned out what are we gonna do? And they decided across their schools, they would have, they formed committees. It was their idea to form committees and they had sort of like the, the uh, Recycle It bracelet committee that was a lot of steps actually and getting money for and, and ordering these recycle it bracelets. Uh, they had another committee for engaging with the school principals and, and um, seeking permission to engage in this recycle it cam campaign and get their, their um, support and, and several other committees. Um, it included also looking at, again, well, what are issues in recycling? Why is it not being done? They went to the recycle center here in the community and learned more about recycling processes and challenges to recycling programs um, and, and looked at other issues for why littering and recycling was such a problem in our communities and then thinking about how they could incorporate that in their public information campaign. So they were um, developing social skills of uh, reflexive dialogue, giving constructive feedback to each other through their committees, um, dispositions of assertive self and being an assertive self and community advocate, and, and cultivating actions of planning and implementing their plan and then critically reflecting upon those actions. Here they are implementing their community action. Part of it was they said, all right, um, we need to develop a pledge and, um, and have students pledge that they wanted recycling bins on their school grounds and asking the principals for it and also pledge to engaging in recycling more in school and at home and in their personal lives. And so to sign the uh, petition, they had to first state what their pledge was and how they were going to support recycling. Then they could sign the petition and get their coveted recycle it ban. And uh, the youth were just the, the youth and PAC were so excited to see how engaged their classmates were, their peers were in really participating in this petition. Uh, they also did public information campaigns. They they got on the PA every day of the week. It happened to be Earth Week, good timing, to talk about the importance of recycling and, um, and fun facts about recycling and so forth. And, um, and so they, they really cultivated critical community knowledge um, of issues. They cultivated transformative democratic action skills and dispositions of a willingness to engage with people of power and to take agency and choice and actions. And then um, finally, actions of presenting, organizing events, meeting with public officials, and um, cultivating public information or creating public information campaigns. So a lot of opportunities for cultivating um, critical civic capacities throughout this project. Um, fortunately, the local paper, um, caught wind of this project, don't know how, maybe I might've contacted them. <laughs> um, and, but fortunately they came out and, and uh, met with the youth themselves to talk about this project, which just further empowered the young people. They're quoted throughout the article. And then one of the challenges is how do you do all this in one short school year? We met two hours after school each week. Um, it was really a lot to go through all of these stages and phases. And um, by the time they got the petition out, 
to the principals. The principal said, okay, we'll take you up on it. But it was actually a couple of years before these recycle bins appeared on the playgrounds so they're, they're, and, and, and school grounds. So they probably weren't there to see it in their own school, but they still talked about by the end of the project, how important it was for them to gain these, to, to feel empowered in these ways and to feel like they could really make a difference in their community. Glad Ross is here. Hi. My name is Ross Wilkinson, my doctoral <laughs> candidate. I'm, I'm here at CSU in School of Ed. I made it. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we wanted to ask y'all to do today is try and apply um, what we've talked about a little bit here. Uh, and so we're going to ask you to do a think pair share. Um, and I want you to look across uh, the critical civic capacities table, which you should have had a handout for, um, and consider where you had the opportunity to engage maybe in your own life um, in these critical civic capacities. Um, we also want to talk, ask you uh, where was an opportunity to engage, uh, where might you have an opportunity to engage these more fully in your life? Um, and then what barriers or challenges might prevent programs fully engaging participants in critical civic capacities? And how would these be overcome? So before we ask you to do that, I want to share one little quick thing about the barriers that we saw. Um, so um, you had the Whitefish River First Nation example. Um, and some of the barriers um, to that were around uh, the actual process of uh, reflection, critical reflection, the challenging process of reflecting on the socio-political issues in your community, because sometimes those can bring up some very emotional topics, um, especially um, in the Whitefish River First Nation example where we had um, some youth committing suicide. And so to bring up those topics can be quite challenging. So it's resource intensive, that's what they said. Um, and so that's one of the barriers we found. We also saw um, different examples. So another example that we had of a barrier, maybe you can contemplate as you're working through this is, um, we had an example of uh, a school. Um, we're implementing a CYE type um, program and the youth were engaged in trying to make some kind of change. They identified, they wanted to change the uh, the snacks in the vending machine to be more healthy. They are like, this is what we want. We identified the problem. They contacted vendors. They drafted a proposal. Um, they talked to community partners and leaders and all these people. It took a full year. They drafted the proposal and they brought it to the principal of the school and the principal just said no. And so is that empowering? Um, we talked about these critical civic capacities. All of these capacities that they gained across um, the process were, was great, and that was empowering, but at the end, uh, if they didn't meet that um, actually seeing your change happen, were they empowered or were they disempowered by that no? Um, and so those are the kind of questions we're grappling with right now. And maybe you can think through those um, with your partner just for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll come back and do a little debrief. Yeah, and if you're online, uh, we learned we're not able to put you into breakout groups, but please don't leave. Please just think through these questions for yourself. Have a little dialogue with yourself. And we're going to come back and um, share out and have time for your questions, your observations, and then thinking about additional actions that you can take uh, toward civic engagement. Um, so yes, please stay online if you're there. And, um, and if you are here in the room, please pair up with somebody next to you. You can do two groups of two or three and think about these questions. Sure, and I'm going to go ahead and go back to the table of the civic capacities. How many people do we have on there? 22. 22. Mm -hmm. So those of you online, I'll go back to that table. And, um, and if you don't get to all these questions, no problem. Just talk about civic capacities and anything you want to talk about, how it applies to your lives. Uh, what suggestions you have, what barriers you see, and so forth. Um, and I will go back to that table. All right, feel free to pair up if you're in the room or get together with two people, uh, three people.
We'll take about one more minute for those of you online, and then we'll be coming back to the presentation. your discussion. Um, what insights uh, did you gain from your small group? This is just a, these are just general questions, uh, kind of debrief. Uh, what did you think about the uh, presentation itself and the content? What questions might you have about um, this idea of uh, engaging in sociopolitical action to affect change in order to um, create a more democratic society and, and a more engaged citizenry? Um, and how has uh, CYA framework of critical civic capacities in, might inform your future work, directly or indirectly? And then based on what you learned today, what near-term and long-term actions might you plan to take with this new knowledge that you have? Uh, any thoughts, questions, comments? Can we hear that there is a comment from somebody online? Yes, that's right. So the Collaborative for Student Achievement says, uh, for me, it's volunteering my time to get to learn about our communities, attend professional development, learn as much as I can about our community, and decipher in my own mind how we can better assist our communities. Oh, excellent. Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's quite a commitment, isn't it, to be an engaged citizen? I know I went for the first time, uh, I had to find our town hall, and I just realized I've been living in this community for 15 years, and there are actually like four different buildings for uh, related to the town hall, and I, I finally went to the, the fourth one I went to, the last one. Um, uh, and so, yeah, just realizing, wow, I really need to up my game and be more engaged in my community. So that's a really important aspect of it is, is finding ways to get involved in your community. Yeah. To the type of engagement as well. Uh, so we, one of the frameworks we used um, by some authors, Westheimer and Kahn, they talk about different types of citizenship and different types of engagement in citizenship. And so like the, the idea that... We, Oh, did you go over it? Yeah. Oh, I never mind. I went over it. <laughs> um, yeah, those different types of citizenship and how you engage participatory or justice oriented. So, any other thoughts or comments or questions? Any great insights from your conversations that you would like to share? I think in this group, we talked about a lot about barriers mm, yeah. and these programs. You want to share? Yeah. Um, we were just saying that sometimes it's hard for young people to look into the community and think about the needs that the community have because of the college experience and the workload and the uh, overwhelming feelings of having to comply with everything that sometimes they, they are too much into fulfilling their needs and their goal within college life that that leaves very little room for them to look outside and see what are the needs of other people so that's something we have to consider and think about. yes and think about in our own programs our own universities schools how can we bring these civic capacities into our curriculum so that it's not an add-on or an extra but just a part of a youth members of a youth's life and life worlds and uh, educational worlds. I think one of the challenges we face too is that schools are, if we look at you know secondary education, are pretty isolated from the community at times. Uh, it's hard for teachers to bring the community into the school, and there's often a lot of barriers and red tape there. Um, and then there's questions of should we in certain areas. 
um, as well. You know, should we talk about what just happened down the road yesterday in that shooting? Or should we talk about this thing in this class? Those big questions that you grapple with, should we ignore those things? Um, I think that oftentimes uh, bringing the community problems or issues, maybe not necessarily problems, issues into the classroom is not, is not a terrible thing. It's just a challenging thing to do uh, for teachers to do. Well, and it's getting more challenging to do in certain states now with certain laws being passed that are, you know, um, limiting what type, what topics you can talk about in schools. If you're in Florida, Texas, you know, they're eliminating DEIJ positions. They're threatening teachers with firing for bringing up topics like that. Um, and so, you know, we as citizens really need to engage in our communities to make sure that, that we're um, responding to those political actions and taking action of our own to have a more equity-centered education. Going back to the comment of a person, sorry, um, going back to the comment of the person online, so we have some, they have people who's very committed mm -hmm. to uh, community actions, but also have you, like you said, they really, it's hard for them to balance like work, life, and also community engagement. So in our group discussion, we talk about the role of communication, the mm -hmm. role of tourism leader, um, like how to do outreach to to reach like the youth and having like a role model, having mm -hmm. um, is it the role role model? Role models, role models, community leaders, mm -hmm. right? People that they can trust to say this is a good program. Mm -hmm. It's worth your time. Yes. Also seeing like the, the outcomes, I think like the photos from the PAC programs can be very inspiring, seeing like how, you know, just the meaningful work and also the fun like the youth have in those programs mm -hmm. and showcasing here's the outcome that this is, you can be part of this too. So something like this is just more visualize like the outcomes, the success, this, the capacities that you can develop throughout the process. Please, you would like to say. Yeah, we so we both work with international students too. One of the things we were talking about is uh, coming from a community where you accept things to be a certain way, and then you're in a new place and you're forming a new community, and how that can be both very like you can see a lot, right? You're coming into community, you're seeing all these problems potentially because you're new and you're not used to this, but also the like trying to form a community while you're here so that you can maybe solve some of the problems or help yourself, and some of the isolation that comes with having to join a new community where you. And you feel like you don't belong at first and you need to kind of settle in before you can step to that next level. Yeah. And then diversity can be very beneficial too because international students, they come with a different perspective. So they have a different lens to look at those community issues. So again, the responsibilities of our institutions to create those opportunities to involve, you know, a variety of people in, um, in all things related to their you know, community and to think of community, not just as the Fort Collins community, but the university community or the college community or the housing community, you know, how can you get engaged and involved um, in those ways and make sure our institutions are, are offer, offering opportunities to belong and, and to bring in and invite in diverse perspectives and, and multiple people. Yeah, one of the things I'm hearing a lot too is that it, you know, in, in order to do all of those things, in order to engage as a participatory citizen or just a citizen, you, it is a privilege because you, you do have to have time and and the energy. Um, you can't be putting all your energy into trying to just um, exist um, because then you can't support others. Um, and so um, it is a privilege. Um, it's not something that um, everyone can do all the time. And so um, we need to find out when we can and then try to make the effort to. Yeah, make sure our, our, our institutions are integrating it into activities that it's not, again, an, an additional thing you have to add to your plate, but something that's already part of your work life or your, your school life or other parts of your life. Yes. Another from online. Well, as Eisenberg says, it's been fortunate in Colorado with the political climates. I was able to designate two class periods last semester in my high school history class to talk about the ongoing and historical Israel-Palestine conflicts. But what I found out when having a class discussion on their own agencies as American young adults in terms of exploring national and domestic security 
it was hard to combat a lot of apathy in the high schoolers or a sense of resignation to events beyond their control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working at a high school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I watched a, a wonderful TED Talk the other day about um, this generational difference in how we view the future um, and how um, prior to the millennial generation, oftentimes the future was viewed in very positive light, flying cars and, and giant, um, you know, beautiful towers made of glass and all those things. And, and now um, we're, you know, our generations, millennial, millennial and after are coming to the realization that maybe those things aren't going to come to fruition and that maybe the future doesn't look as bright. Um, and um, and I still think it's important to talk about, <laughs> you know, even if it's hard. And I, and I, and I think that uh, it is hard to talk about. And a lot of the times, the reason it's difficult, because I, I teach in high school as well, and I think a lot of times it is difficult is because of the ideas that are coming. Um, they're not often, from the students, they're not often grounded in a, in a whole bunch of experience, right? And a whole bunch of uh, nuanced, like, knowings. Um, and instead, they're based on things that they've heard or things that exist in their house, or maybe, um, you know, just something that was talked about in the schoolyard. And so uh, it's challenging to, but it's it's good because that's when you can catch people to redirect those kinds of thoughts and to, and to, uh, to kind of, um, you know, foster more democratic thinking. And commending you, the person who made the comment, for bringing that into your high school classroom um, and yeah. having those courageous conversations. Yeah. Uh, there are resources, if, if you're not aware, for supporting courageous conversations uh, across different age groups. Um, we'll try to gather those, make them available for anybody who's interested. Um, but I think we need to add to that then some of these other civic capacities. Well, then what actions can you take? And maybe that's even writing a letter to your senator, you know, or, or making a class phone call or class letter you know, saying, hey, you know, we think this is really important to address. Um, maybe it's um, writing a letter to the editor in the local newspaper or, or a national paper. Maybe, you know, for these younger generations, it's something more with social media um, and getting engaged that way. So finding ways that um, people can, you know, finding out about youth organizations, youth civic action and social action organizations like Greta, Thunberg's organization around the environment that um, give young people a voice in, in taking steps. So we need to do what we can to help connect those um, civic organizations with our young people so they can get involved. We are at a time. I want to first also acknowledge um, Sylvia Terrell here, who has also recently joined our CYE team. and. Um, and glad for your participation, and um, and thanks to the International Symposium Organizing Committee <laughs> for hosting us today.